So my name's Laura Dalton. I'm a PhD candidate at North Carolina State University. Uh, my advisor is Dr. Mel Porgaz. And today I'll be presenting on does ITZ influence moisture transport in concrete? And this work was a collaboration with NIST, uh, specifically with Dr. Lamana and Dr. Jones. So a little bit of background, the interfacial transition zone or ITZ as I'll refer to it throughout the rest of this presentation was first discovered by Ferran in 1956. And basically this is a region right along the aggregate that is supposed to be a slightly more porous region relative to the bulk cement paste. And so over the years, this, um, there have been many transport and structural deviations um, kind of attributed to this ITZ region. And it's kind of become its own area of research in and of itself. Um, but in 1986, uh, Diamond, Sydney Diamond uh, kind of questioned the previous interpretation of ITZ that kind of how it had been interpreted was that it was this perfect ring uh, of a slightly more porous region uh, that was all around the aggregate. And he was basically saying that that might not be the case. It might be kind of intermittent uh, throughout or around the various aggregates. But this work was kind of overlooked and not, um, I don't want to say ignored, but kind of overlooked and not much was taken from there. It, and so ITZ continued to be studied uh, and it's been reported to be anywhere from 15 to 100 microns in thickness, but most widely accepted is 30 to 50 microns. Um, and again, it's still being studied today and many phenomena that we see um, from transport structural, like I said before, deviations have been attributed to this region. Um, but Diamond had also done some other work with some of his students that still kind of questioned to what extent ITZ really contributes to the various things that we see. Um, so the research question that we came up with was if ITZ is this slightly more porous region around the aggregate. And when I say more porous, I'm meaning on the nanometer scale. So this is still capillary and gel pores that we're talking about. So we would expect that water would move more rapidly relative to the bulk cement paste during unsaturated flow. So do we actually see this? So the idea is if we have this single aggregate in this ITZ region, we had water, water was absorbed, but then it would hit this ring and kind of have this preferential pathway that's slightly faster around the aggregate. So we wanted to be able to study this. So we thought, okay, neutron and X-ray, we can combine these two and get complementary information um, and these both have, both of these modalities have very high spatial resolutions. So we made um, concrete samples that had single coarse aggregate uh, and then tested uh, using the next system. So here we have our sample and we have our neutrons and our X-rays um, perpendicular to one another so that you can get that complementary information. We did some large projection scans of the dry uh, sample before water was added, and then a series of sparse projection scans during um, water ingress. So, and that was at 60 projections per hour. So that's a temporal resolution of one hour we were able to achieve for this first uh, test, testing this out. So, and then it's a 30 micron per voxel resolution, um, which is around 60 micron spatial resolution. So, what were we able to get from this? So phase segmentation was uh, heavily improved. So these are the high, higher um, projection scans for the neutron and X-ray. And basically we're able to combine this information and then segment out our fine, our coarse aggregates very well. And then the hydrated cement, unhydrated cement and our entrapped air very well. And this is just for basics of how well can we actually segment out those phases using that complementary information. But then the main part of this work and what we're really trying to get out of it was seeing this water moisture transport. And so what we were able to do with the reconstruction techniques is actually use those um, high uh, projection scans as a seed for the sparse projection scans. because So the sparse Fewer projections means you don't get quite as good information. So we're able to use that higher um, projection scan as a seed and kind of like map our sparser projection uh, results to that. And it actually really enhanced our final reconstructions for the sparse uh, projection um, scans during water ingress. So here we're just seeing each iteration. We observed it for nine hours. So 
the temporal resolution was one hour and we observed it for a series of nine hours. So in the x-ray, we're not really seeing much of a change, but here you can see a bit of a change in the neutron, which is what we expect. We're really using the x-ray to look at changes in density. So it's good at um, capturing the detail of the structure, whereas neutron is very good at capturing the moisture. Um, so what are we actually looking at with these? So here's our high water content cement paste. So that's the bright region or the higher attenuating region. And then our low water content cement paste is this, um, is the darker gray that we see. And then here's our coarse aggregate, um, the fine aggregate, harder to see because quite small <laughs> in relation to the scale, uh, scanning scales here. And then uh, our pores. But here we clearly see that the water is advancing um, down into the sample. And we clearly see that change um, from hour to hour. So then the next result was actually taking these reconstructions and segmenting out the water. So here are the water plume advancement per hour. So we can see that it's clearly advancing just um, pretty consistently throughout the cement pace. We're not seeing any preferential movement. Um, so this is through hour nine and then combined. Um, we can take a look at this from the projections and actually look at it from these reconstruction uh, segmented Im images as well. So here on the left, we have the projections or the radiographs. So just the images you're taking uh, with time that are then used for your reconstruction. But again, here we would expect to see a dark ring, um, but we don't see that uh, even at the projection. Uh, scales. And here, as we actually saw all the advancement of the water, if we actually cut into the sample and try to look right along the edge of the aggregate in this water plume, we still just see that there's no preferential movement that we're seeing here. Um, so the next thing I did was I took basically hour one and hour two. So I took hour two reconstruction and subtracted hour one, and then that basically what's left is what change occurred between the two scans. So that would be representative of the water that moved into uh, a region between that scan and the next. And so again, what we're seeing is that there's really just this incremental movement. There is a bit of a residual movement here up on the corner, which I think is just because the aggregate is slightly off-centered. Um, but that's all that we see until around hour eight to seven, we do see this little bit of a, like this gap here, which basically just means that there was no change there. Um, you could argue that water may have made it there and that's why it's showing no change. Well, that doesn't really make sense because if the water had made it there at the scales of the gap that we're seeing, it would have been captured at this resolution. So, Here's just another view of that. So I'm basically showing you the results from the bottom of the sample. So again, early on, we don't see this gap or uh, no change around the aggregate. It's not until about hour six that it kind of shows up somewhat. Um, but again, it doesn't mean that water moved there before that and then there was no change, but that uh, the water, that we may just not have water moving into that region yet. Um, and this is of interest for future work as to why we actually might be seeing um, even a delayed response uh, just in this random region, because it's quite a large region. It's much larger than what the ITZ region would be. So again, I, we don't believe that this can be attributed to that, at least not from this one study. So um, the, the other thing I checked was just actually trying to quantify the water um, movement. So I just used the water volumes and was able to plot those as a function of the square root of time. And that just shows that the water was moving as a following a linear trend as we expect in um, unsaturated flow. And here is just a plot of the water penetration depth. So within nine hours, the water penetrated about two and a quarter centimeters into the sample. Um, and with that, just a quick summary. Um, so this was very much technique development using the next system um, to image water and grass and concrete. 
Uh, we use the seated reconstruction technique. So I don't think I actually mentioned this, but this was adaptive steepest descent projection onto convex, convex sets. So that was the actual technique that was used. And that really enhanced our ability to extract uh, the water um, migration throughout the sample. And then uh, we don't see, or at least at the resolutions, the temporal and the spatial resolutions of this study, we did not see expedited transport around that ITZ region. Um, but it is possible that this could require um, higher temporal and spatial resolutions to um, study this in the future. So that is definitely uh, something that we will look into for future studies. Um, additionally, some ongoing work um, in relate, that's also related to this is, I've been looking at using electrical capacitance tomography, which has a very high temporal resolution to also study uh, not only um, concrete, so concrete uh, that also only has a single aggregate in the sample, but also if we can detect moisture movement with cracks and ag like single aggregates and study that. So um, this work has been part of a Fulbright project that I was uh, in Finland working on and those are forthcoming results. But basically we have been able to detect water moving through cracks in the concrete and we're using um, basically a known location of approximately where that aggregate is and using that information to also um, help our reconstructions for this technique. Um, but this is ongoing work uh, and hopefully those results will uh, tell us more about the ITZ region here soon. Um, and some acknowledgements, uh, NIST, uh, North Carolina State University, and then um, Fulbright Finland Foundation and the University of Eastern Finland for the last bit of work that's ongoing and will be future, future work. So with that, thank you. And I would be happy to take any questions. Um, and here's my email if uh, someone would want to email me.